Welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs mini podcast. These short podcasts are meant to supplement the full length episodes that I do with Scott Stewart and Jess Terrell, in which we generally talk about one of Edgar Rice Burroughs books in detail. My name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books about what I call pre-digital pop culture, things like the pulp magazines that Burroughs was published in, old-time radio, classic comic books, old uh, B-movies, and so on. And I keep a blog about such things at comics, old-time radio, and other cool stuff. Right now, we're using the mini-podcast to do a chapter-by-chapter summary of the 1912 novel A Princess of Mars. Please note that we will be including spoilers both in, uh, regarding the chapter that we're discussing today and for the rest of the book and possibly for other books in the series. I would also recommend that you reread today's chapter before listening to the podcast, as I will be assuming that you are familiar with the events we are discussing. Today we're going to be looking at chapters 25 and 26. And these two chapters both feature epic large-scale battles. First, the capture and looting of Zodanga, and then the air battle and the ground battle around helium. The nearly nonstop action is described in a logical manner so that we always understand what's going on and we can grasp the tactics being used. And his prose keeps the narrative fast-paced and exciting. We start with John Carter interrupting the wedding with a dramatic smash through through a window. It makes me regret that I didn't have a chance to rescue Angela from an enforced wedding by smashing through a window before we got married. But oddly, she says that our normal wedding ceremony was sufficient. Women, huh? The battle in the throne room is given extra attention by the fact that John Carter cannot personally kill Sab Fan, and that Carter, despite his skill and his earth agility, is soon in danger of being overwhelmed by sheer numbers. This leads to the second dramatic entrance in the chapter, as Tars Tarkas bursts into the room, and as Burroughs describes it, quote, with one swing of his mighty longsword, he laid a dozen corpses at his feet. And so he hewed a pathway before him until in another moment, he stood upon the platform beside me, dealing death and destruction right and left, unquote. Now, with apologies to Tom and Huck and to Sam and Frodo and George and Lenny, John Carter and Tars Tarkas are clearly the, uh, the most awesome pair of friends in literature. Now, one interesting blink and you miss it moment in this battle uh, is uh, that... Uh, Than Cossus has been presented as a poor leader who started an unjust war, but he puts up a good fight against John Carter. Anyway, the battle is won, Cantos Can is freed from the dungeon, and chapter 25 ends with one of my favorite lines of prose of all time. And thus, in the midst of a city of wild conflict, filled, filled with the alarms of war, with death and destruction reaping their terrible, har- terrible harvest all around her, did Deja Thoris, princess of Helium, True daughter of Mars, the god of war, promised himself in marriage, promised herself in marriage to John Carter, gentleman of Virginia. But the fighting isn't over yet, as the besieged city of Helium still needs to be saved. The Tharks are loaded onto captured Zodangan warships. The scales of the upcoming battles are huge. There's 250 warships carrying nearly 100,000 Tharks. That, by the way, is 400 Tharks per ship. We soon see the Tharks using their rifles in the upcoming battle rather than Navy guns because they didn't use their ships and weren't trained in using the naval guns. This makes sense, though it makes me wonder who the heck was piloting the ships. I kind of picture them zigzagging uncertainly across the skies as untrained Tharks nervously operate them. There is one line of prose at the beginning of chapter 26 that's worth discussion. After finishing uh, chapter 25, But before reading this chapter, Angela brought up a fair point. She wondered how the non-Thark green men in Zodanga would be prevented from simply slaughtering the civilians as they looted the city. The looting had to happen. This was their promised reward for helping. And it seemed to her that it would lead to all sorts of unpleasantness. Now, it had been a few years since I last read the book, and I simply didn't remember this detail. I suggested that maybe Tars Tarkas had gotten them to promise not to do any wanton killing afterwards. Take, uh, take stuff, but don't slaughter the populace. Angela effectively countered this argument by pointing out that though Green Martians had an honor system about keeping their word, there were, were dishonorable people among them. Sarkoja and Tal Hadjis were prime examples of this. 
Then in chapter 26, we learn this, quote, Behind us, we left the stricken city in the fierce and brutal clutches of some 40,000 green warriors of the lesser hordes. They were looting, murdering, and fighting among themselves. In a hundred places, they had applied the torch, and columns of dense smoke were rising above the city, as though to blot out from the eye of heaven the horrid sights beneath. So yes, the non-Tharkians did murder, burn, and even fight among themselves. John Carter, more concerned with saving helium than sparing Zodanga, simply leaves Zodanga to its fate. There is a sense of tragedy to this, because Burroughs had several times pointed out that despite a bad ruler, the people of Zodanga were honorable and brave. The themes of this novel include loyalty, friendship, and the value of compassion. Here, though, we get an opportunity to debate what actions are moral within the context of a just war. I don't think Burroughs intended to deal with this particular issue here. I think he was just letting the story play out in a logical manner. But the story plays out in a way that does invite this debate. Is John Carter justified in leaving Zodanga to its terrible fate? But can he take time to deal with this when helium is in danger of being conquered? It's something that invites us, invites, that invites an interesting back and forth of ideas. Now, the ensuing air battle over helium is awesome, and it's punctuated by John Carter's sense of tragedy that a ship commander who loses must throw himself to his death. Here again, we get a respect for brave men despite their being enemies, uh, which, we, which can play back to the debate over Zodanga's fate. In terms of the tactics used in the battle, it's a nice touch that Thark marksmanship, mentioned so prominently in an earlier chapter, plays a decisive factor in this fight. Now, the ground combat is a prime example of how, despite the existence of rapid-fire rifles, Martian tactics involve cavalry charges that bring everyone into hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's also noteworthy that no air support is used by helium forces. In real-life terms, we see a battle being described in pre-World War I terms, when the effectiveness of rapid-fire weapons and aircraft in war hadn't yet been demonstrated. In-universe, we see battle tactics dictated by the rigid Martian code of honor and their inherent love of a good fight. Near the end of the chapter, after Helium is saved, we get a nice moment in which Dejah's father, who is known to be a skilled and fearless warrior, gets choked up when he realizes his daughter is alive and safe. This plays nicely into the idea that John Carter once discussed when he was a prisoner of the Tharks, that softer emotions do not conflict with being a warrior. I also love the dignity which with, Tars Tar which, with which Tars Tarkas and other Thark leaders uh, uh, display themselves. I suspect that Burroughs is thinking of the dignity often displayed by Native American leaders that was often so surprising to white Americans who thought of them as savages. That's it for now. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Please visit my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff. You'll also be able to find links to my Amazon.com author page there. Thank you for listening. We'll be back with another uh, mini podcast soon. And keep an ear out also for our full-length episodes.